Medellin in the 1990s was considered the most dangerous city in the world, but you wouldn't know it today. In 2013, it was crowned Innovative City of the Year, due in large part to its first-class public transportation system. And in 2016, the World Travel Awards named it the best destination in South America, citing its beautiful architecture, perfect year-round weather, and rich culture. Unfortunately though, thanks to shows like Entourage and Narcos, when most Americans hear the name Medellin, they think of one person and one person only. Pablo Escobar was the former leader of the Medellin cartel, which in the 1980s was responsible for 80% of the global cocaine market and unspeakable violence. While most locals would prefer to leave that dark chapter of their city's history in the past, I felt obligated to learn more about this nefarious character while in town. Today, we are ready to start uh, the tour, Pablo Square tour. But I wouldn't be going on an Escobar tour with some random guide off the street. I'd be going with an ex-cop named Carlos, who was on the SWAT team that helped track down Pablo after he escaped from prison. About 28 years ago, 26, I was fighting here with my gun, a lot of my friends dying for that one, and now I'm making him under, under his name. It's controversial, but when I started to be a tour guy in 2014, I figured out over here these people making this kind of tour. But they glorify him because that was the hitman, there was his brother, there was family of him, there was people really fanatic about the guy. I'm more focused about the victims. Carlos saw firsthand what it was like living under Pablo's reign of terror. I was really clear, in case it close to die three times. Uh, two car bombs. In one time, when hitmen's assassin sicarios went behind me to try to kill me, because I had a price for my head, you know. Pablo would pay people to kill a cop. A Medellin cartel. He said uh, Medellin yeah. cartel, Bob. The leader was Pablo Escobar. Every single police officer over here, we had a price. I started $100. Mm -hmm. When I was a commander, that was around $500. Yeah. And when I went there in the special unit, they put a price something close to $1,000 or $2,000 if somebody can kill them. And most of his fellow police officers never made it out alive. How we, many of, of these people died? 149. Wow. Over there, we are 152. So only three people only three still people alive. Still alive that between five to 10 police officers a day. The first stop on the tour was the home of Pablo's brother, Roberto, which he's turned into a Pablo Escobar museum. We're going in to uh, meet Pablo's brother. We don't know if we can film, so we're gonna put the cameras down at first. We don't wanna piss off that guy. We were told not to film, but still managed to sneak some cell phone shots in while one of Pablo's old associates showed us around the place. When the Medellin cartel was at the height of its power, the home was one of Pablo's main safe houses which would explain all the secret compartments for hiding money. This was a room that you could not see. Yeah, we could all do and found a, a big sack of, uh, of money. The humanity destroyed the money. Drugs. Oh, 100 kilograms in both. Cut it one by one. And people. The house was strategically built on a hillside with views of the airport so Pablo could keep tabs on his shipments of cash arriving from the U.S. and even talk to the pilots via walkie-talkie. After Roberto served his 11-year prison sentence, he moved back in and filled it with memorabilia from Pablo's life. We saw our old family photos, some of Pablo's bulletproof cars. That was AK-47 long gun. That was a uh, grenade and the original jet ski from the James Bond flick, A Spy Who Loved Me. He fell in love with this. Call his body gun. Hey guys, come on. I to go to England. Talk with the producer of 07 movies. I'm bring me something even in using Roger Moore. I'm bring me another for my brother. At the end of the tour, I had a chance to sit down and talk to Roberto himself. Very nice to meet you. Roberto, que mucho gusto conocerlo, dice él. Roberto, 
Go. Which was tough, seeing as while he was in prison, a rival cartel sent him a pipe bomb, which blew up in his face and left him partially blind in death. Why did the government allow him to open up the museum? Porque es una obligación darle que las personas de edad y discapacitadas puedan trabajar. However, in 2018, the museum was temporarily shut down for promoting mafia culture. Seguía cuando era ilegal. Ahora que soy legal también me persiguen igual. En Estados Unidos, en Cagliari Capone, en ¿cómo se llama? En París, está eh, Hitler. Todos los países del mundo, todos han tenido conflictos. Todo el mundo. Y aquí el gobierno lo, lo cerró. Para que nadie mirara para la represa y tuango. Para que mirara para Mónaco, donde estaban tumbando y para acá. ¿Ya? Para poderse apoderar de la plata de los pobres. During the cartel's heyday, Roberto was its accountant. Que llegó a tener en el 89 más de mil millones de dólares en una caleta. En, el ocho, en un año tan. Y que a eso súmele que fue el inventor de que la plata no se contaba, sino que se pesaba. Porque ya les dolían los dedos de contar. But his real passion had always been cycling. Mr. Roberto was the American championship of cycling. Very famous cycling in Colombia. These days, he's most famous for trying to sue Netflix over their depiction of his family in the show Narcos, claiming to have invented a cure for AIDS and releasing a foldable phone. Thanks for showing me your home. Muchas gracias por haber mostrado su hogar. Our handshake was as awkward as it looked. It's weird dapping up someone who has never shown remorse for the 4,000 deaths his cartel was responsible for. In his eyes, he and his brother were just victims of the violent and poor circumstances they grew up in. While most Colombians aren't satisfied with that excuse and will avoid even saying the name Escobar. He was a criminal, he was a psychopath, he was a assassin, he was a narco. Roberto isn't the only one that thinks his brother has gotten a bad rap. The other side of him He's like a Robin Hood. He sell to the rich in the U.S. and then use that money to help the poor in Colombia. Yeah, those guys believe in him. They look like Pablo Escobar, like a, like a god. And nowhere is that more apparent than Barrio Pablo. Do you see all those houses there in the in bricks? Yes. That is Pablo Escobar's neighborhood. Those are all the homes that yeah. he built. Before 1982, this neighborhood was an absolute dump, filled with thousands of people unable to put a roof over their heads. But then Pablo, looking to win over public support and enter politics, provided them with building materials, furniture, and homes. And ever since, the locals in Barrio Pablo have been his biggest fans. He helped develop this whole part of the city. 360, o sea, todo el terreno era de él. Because that was here was a farm. Oh. And he built 360 houses. And then we persecuted Pablo Escobar. When he died, his mother donated to the people over here the rest of the, of the land. So, so the people came here and started to build another house. The government never gave to those guys like a support. We're talking in the Navy, you know? So coming here, a guy like a Pablo Escobar with good money, and give those guys a good support. So that was a gift, you know? Now had a roof. Most probably those guys glorify him. And they most definitely did. His face is everywhere. There was a shrine to Nina de Anocha, the patron saint of those unjustly imprisoned, who was a favorite of Pablo's mother. Pablo had this in his prison? Yes. And a mural of Pablo's most treasured racehorse, who had to be cloned after it was stolen and castrated by his rivals. In the whole, the guy, Mr. Roberto Escobar, said in that time, that was 20 million US dollars. And they chop off his balls. Yes, exactly, you know, they yeah. buy 20 million. His mug was even on the front of barber shops. But all this Pablo worship isn't done solely to honor his legacy. Do they use the photo of Pablo because it helps attract turistas? Yes. Yeah. It's only this neighborhood. 
Yeah. Because many tourists coming here, they, oh, where I can see yeah, photo of Pablo Escobar with the graffiti. Yeah. Uh, say, no, only American Europeans coming here, they think that is the, the Medellin of Pablo. So yeah. I'm about to show, uh, spread to this guy, not the Medellin of Pablo. Yeah. Never was a Medellin of Pablo. In 1991, Pablo offered to turn himself into the Colombian government and serve a maximum term of five years in prison under a few conditions. They couldn't extradite him to the U.S. He would be allowed to design his own prison. And that if there's no cops near the prison? No, around seven kilometers. All right. Only he's a personal army. So, one. yeah, he didn't really go to prison. He just went to his pleasure palace here. He had a party here, a lot of prostitutes coming here to get a party. The prison Pablo made for himself was called La Cathedral, but was often referred to as Hotel Escobar, or Club Cathedral, and for good reason. Man, for me, that was the best Airbnb I never saw in my life. Yeah. Man, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You had a casino, man. It featured a casino, a bar, a jacuzzi, a waterfall. He had his private room. Yeah. A luxury room. Luxurious views of the city where he could see his daughter while talking to her on the phone using a mounted telescope. That guy can control everything here. And a football pitch. He would bring in some professional players to play with him, right? Yeah, so one of them, uh, I, we are really sure, was René Guita. He's a goalkeeper. He's really famous until today. Another guy you say was Maradona. Maradona. Maradona, okay. I don't know, I, I, I don't have evidence, but I went in here. But only can, I can say he, Maradona, he, he loved cocaine. And if all that didn't keep him entertained, he'd just smuggle in some more fun. So the prostitutes were allowed to come? Yes, okay. Mr. Jose Alvaro, Mr. Yeah. Nemo, the taxi driver. Yeah. So the taxi driver, he drove a big trucks too. He put out like a fake wall, so where there was all the prostitutes. And when the army or the cops or somebody got to share what happened there, the people only see the furniture or the food for cathedral. They never see the fake in the coming the prostitutes. Ah, yeah. No only pro normal prostitutes come here to get a party with Pablo. Mm. Man, important people around the world. Over here, when Pablo Square, they want to get a relationship with a woman he saw in TV. Yeah. And it's a dream. Yeah. Man, you saw Pamela Anderson on TV, I want to fuck her. Yeah. In, in the, and the next night, next day, is there with you? Fuck, man, that is the money. Yeah. So people flow out the country, make the, all the a deal, and that woman came here. Was an artist, he's from Brazil, uh, his nickname is Susa. She's still alive. She's man, she's hot. You know who's Pele? Yeah. She was Pele's wife in that time. And Paulo Escobar want to, you know what I mean? He, he want to fuck. He want to fuck Pele's Pele's wife. Yeah, Pele's yeah. wife. And Paulo, what a flex. Yeah. yeah. And Paulo Escobar offered at a woman five million US dollars. And the woman say no. Because that was the only woman saying not to Pablo Escobar, was Susan. I mean, I'd probably have sex with Pablo for five million. <laughs> so, so do I. Yeah. Man, so fuck man, Yo, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And when the DEA needed proof that Pablo was in a real prison, he just sent them a photo behind bars. This is what Pablo did. Yeah. <laughs> to convince people he was in prison. The photo you saw him with a Russian cop. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Russian had him in. Yeah. He had a, a small smile because the photographer say he took 30 minutes to do the photo because he can't stop to laugh. The Colombian government was fine turning a blind eye to Pablo's shenanigans until he started murdering former associates from prison. Behind that one, that was the, I called that one the torture room. He killed the guy because he thought he's stealing money from him. You guys came here to see him. Pablo Escobar was really mad. Those guys killed a guy, cut in small pieces, and then put a Nazi. So the, the body is gone. I don't know how many people was killed then, because all those guys was kidnapped for, for Medellin. To here, all those guys is dead, don't still alive. How many? I don't know. Once the government had proof of Pablo murdering people at Cathedral, they finally took action. He said at the, uh, the police department, we need a special unit, go to prison, and put all those criminals in a real one. In a real prison. In a real prison. 
and Carlos was assigned to the squad, responsible for transporting Pablo to a military jail. I was excited because for the first time, I got to meet that kind of legend. And also because those guys, our commanders, make a promise, you got to get to us five or 10 days off. And over there, I will go to show you army checkpoint. We arrived in around 1 a.m. The army stopped to get inside. Right. When these guys say, yes, that was something called at 5 a.m. The army kind of blocked the road while he escaped? Yes, because these guys control this area. Because Pablo Escobar, he said, I don't want to see any cop around seven kilometers. By the time they arrived at Cathedral, he was nowhere to be found. Over there, in his private room, we found cocaine, but cocaine was for the prostitutes, ah, for yeah. the parties, you know? Yeah. Uh, the beer, the Heineken, guns, and then we found a, a tunnel. That was a strong door. They need three people to push the door, and they found the tunnel. That, that was the stairs, and we found the tunnel over here to over there. While the police did find a tunnel, he didn't even have to use it. Palos never used the tunnel. He was familiar because when he was a child, he came here to play with his cousin, you know? Yeah. He's... He growing up over here. All right, this is Pablo's escape route from the prison. Just walked out the gate and into the jungle. He go over there and straight walking. And then over. eventually got in a car and drove somewhere else and then yeah. gone. I mean, it's not too hard to escape from a prison you built yourself. Even when we arrived here, no Pablo, and our commander said to us, guys, we promise to you, I mean, uh, eight days off, we keep the promise until the day when Ken put the guy in prison or when he died. After this massive fuck up, the DEA took over the operation and Pablo's days were numbered. So the guy was more happy when Pablo's squad escaped from prison was U.S. government. Yeah. Because our system failed and the DA or the US government put all the power. So coming, this came here, ABI, DA, Special Forces, yeah. and a new search block. And sure enough, 16 months later, Pablo's past caught up with him. That was the house. And we can say we found Pablo. The search block was able to track Pablo's phone calls. And every time when Pablo's squad, may, uh, he make a call, get closer and closer and closer. So that day, those guys coming here in a car, undercover, you know, in Pablo's squad, when they had the window second floor, yeah. he was spoken with his son. Hugo Martinez saw him, and that guy say, I'm really sure it's Pablo. And they just coming here immediately. And this guy, Jose Alvaro, uh, he was a taxi driver. The guy went there, or came there with his gun 9 millimeters. He know he got to die. Pablo's taxi driver, Jose Alvarez, was the first to be shot sacrificing himself in order to slow down the cops. Because that guy said, I protect Pablo Escobar, I got to be like a hero for my family, and then my family got to get money. And yeah. That guy got like a pension. My commander, Aguilar, get into the house. That guy moved over here on the second floor, started to shoot him at my commander. My commander tell us he had a big gun, an MP5. So that is a big gun to fight in a small room. It's when he changed his big gun, MP5, yeah. for the smallest, it's a Uzi. Yeah. And then he came from there at his private room. So my commander followed him, took his Uzi, and shot like that. In one bullet, nine millimeters, hit Palos one over here, so over here. But the bullet don't kill him. Oh. He's still fighting. Pablo then tried to jump out the back window, where he was finally killed. That is exactly the place when Palos Cuar died. The last bullet with Palos Cuar was a bullet get into over here, straight, and the other side over here. And Carlos finally got his paid vacation. I'm waiting for 18 months for my eight days off. For your eight days off, yeah. <laughs> Still to this day though, there is no general consensus on who killed Pablo. I have four theories. The first theory is let's say my commander killed him, so that means cops like me with two revenge. First theory. Another theory, that was a sniper. Okay. That's fake. Uh, Los Pepes, the paramilitary guys, those guys say, we killed him, and then we called the cops, Hugo Martinez, and took the photo. All the last one, well, his family say, we're coming for the museum. My brother, my son, my father, he shoot himself. 
four theories and the four theories Paulo Escobar died. Okay. For me, I don't care. Yeah, you just you just care that he's dead. He's gone. Well, Pablo may be dead. So over here is the graveyard of Mr. Paulo Escobar. He died next day of his own birthday. The violence he was responsible for still haunts the people who experienced it. For many years, until I can say until 2015, 16, I have post-trauma war. I can I cannot sleep well. I hear people talk to me. I hear people shoot me. I can hear the the, the sound. Pow, man. I know that is here because anybody follow me. Carlos's stories were disturbing. He narrowly escaped being blown up. I saw another police officer. We are undercover. And I said, "A guy, man, we can we cannot stay longer here in the streets because we are cops." I remember to say that guy, man, I hope to see you later. So I was walking over here when that was a big explosion. Boom. I went there, that was a, a disaster because that was really warm. So the streets was oil, was water, and, and mixed with the blood. People was screaming, people was dying. And my friend, I can found him. We can say one hour later, saw something hanging there at the fourth floor of the building. The explosion sent at the body, at the guy, at the fourth floor. That was my friend. And was almost murdered by assassins on motorbike. I drove a small car, no AC, so the you know, windows was down. When I feel in two, car, uh, two motorcycles follow my car, the most probably coming here was to kill me. Between my legs, I have my own revolver. Nine millimeters was a police gun. You over here had a, gran a grenade. And I'm not throwing the grenade, okay? Yeah. When those guys fall over here, I put my gun, my revolver, left side, I shoot twice. The guys fell off the bike. I don't know what happened with the other guys. I just run away and, and go. And a few months later, you know what happened? What? An enemy called Pablo Square died. So that was a Pablo Pablito. I win because you died first than me. I felt bad making him relive those traumatic years, but Carlos still has a surprisingly positive outlook on life. When I, I, I made this tour, I take a ride here in Medellin, of course, man. I remember over here, I was close to die. Over here was people dying, you know, because that was a bomb. Yeah. So when I start to talk about my experience, what happened in my life, that helps a lot. It helped with the PTSD. Exactly. Yeah. So that is uh, my own therapy. If uh, this therapy, I can make, I can make money. So yeah. it's good. And he's proud of how far Medellin has come since Pablo's death. Pablo's Cuarta in December was safer for cops like me. Right. They stopped to killing cops because no was a guy pay for every cop was killed. Okay. So immediately, man. Immediately, immediately they safe for cops. Yeah. And then. It start to be safer for civilians. Now, gringos like you, uh, Canadians, Mexican, Chinese people, European people, coming here, man, like you, you look like a tourist guy. Yeah. You, sandals, short pants, yeah. uh, like a Miami teacher, sunglasses, yeah. yep. you had the camera, man, you can walk, and also nothing happened. And to show me just how much the city has changed since Pablo's era, he ended the tour by bringing me to Commuter 13. Now in Communa 13, which Carlos tells me used to be arguably the most dangerous neighborhood in the whole world. In the 1980s and 90s, Communa 13, a poor and sprawling neighborhood perched on the hills west of Medellin, was overrun by drug cartels and paramilitary groups who used it as a strategic transit route in and out of the city. Crime skyrocketed, and at one point, it was the most dangerous place in the world having a murder rate of 357 people per 100,000 inhabitants. I only came here twice for 30 minutes with another cops with a big guns and those criminals, guerrilla, paramilitaries and narcos. You know what those guys say to us? Hey, come here if you have the balls. Yeah. We have the balls, but we don't want to create a war. In, in, in an urban war. Urban you know? war. Urban war. In 2002, the government launched Operation Orion, a raid on Commuter 13 involving thousands of police officers, 
aimed at eradicating the neighborhood from a stranglehold of crime. Two helicopters, Black Hawks, the tanks, that was like an Iraq. Innocent people died over here, you yeah. know? That was a big problem, but they need to defeat those criminals because those guys had all the power here. It was effective, but brutal, with many civilians caught in the crossfire. But over the next decade, the government began improving the commune, redeveloping houses and building community centers. When the government do something, and they defeat those guys, so the people start to trust. And then they say, we don't, we don't want more guns in, in our own hands. I don't need to make money to sell drugs. I don't need to make money to kill somebody. I'm an artist, I can paint, I can rap it, I can dance it, I can make empanadas, I can, make, I can put a restaurant, and they live here. It remained isolated from the rest of the city though. So in 2011, the government built a cable car and 384 meters of escalators, which connected it to the surrounding communities. They start to build the electrical stairs, they start to build, to build other people to us, and now it's easier, cheaper, faster, and safer. So everything is good. Ever since then, the community has flourished. It's festive, it's vibrant, the people seem happy, I feel safe and is now the premier arts district of Medellin. Now it's, it's, it's focused more in, in the peace, in the business, yeah. and to be uh, legal. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people rapping, making art, dancing. I love to come here to Comuna 13, man. I can see in your face. Just smile, man. Having so much fun. You do well. Not many gringos can do that one. Confidence through the roof. The world is filled with shitty places. Places where people only live because that's where they were born or they don't have the means to move elsewhere. But Communa 13 and Medellin as a whole are proof that those places don't always have to stay that way. Pablo Escobar tour, that's a, that was the past, you know, that dark tourism. Now when this you come here... the present and the future. And the future. When you came here to Medellin, came here to Comunatio Field. 